Hello, and welcome to a digital statistics lecture for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we're going to be going through section 4.4, Contingency Tables and Association. At this point, we're more or less done with how to connect two quantitative variables together, which is what we were doing with bivariate data. Um, at this point, what we're going to talk about is how to connect two qualitative variables together, where we have different sections for each qualitative variable and trying to see if there's association between the two. We can't really do so with scatter plots, and we're going to need to know a different method to do so. This is also going to lead into what we're going to be dealing with in Chapter 5, which is going to be dealing with probability. Specifically, you will see a lot of this show up starting in Chapter 5.3 and 5.4. All right, so in this section, we have a few definitions to talk about. We are not going to be able to work with scatter plots, but we are going to work with our what we call two-way tables or contingency tables. A contingency table relates two categorical or qualitative variables together, um, where one row will contain one qualitative variable, typically split up into multiple categories, and the column variables will be one qualitative variable split up into multiple categories. When we have a contingency table done, which is just a two-way table, we're also going to create what we call marginal distributions. A marginal distribution is nothing complicated. It's simply a frequency distribution, or relative frequency, in the margins, hence named marginal distribution. So that means that when we are done and we have our two-way table constructed, we will create totals around the table, and that's going to be the marginal distribution. Sometimes we'll take those totals and change them into proportions instead by dividing by the total. That would make it a relative frequency. So it's kind of harkening back to chapter two and three, really. Then the real meat of this section, the real new stuff, is conditional distributions. This is where we're going to make proportional values based on specific conditions. So de depending on some given value or some given variable, that's going to determine how we create specific proportions and will help us define how one variable interacts with another one. What we're going to do is go through a few different examples. The first one's going to be pretty easy. The second one has a lot larger numbers, so it's a little bit more of a pain. All right, uh, first one. A recent survey asked questions about one's level of happiness and their health. So those are our two qualitative variables. We want to investigate whether the two variables are associated. For example, are individuals who are more healthy also more happy? You'll see in this two-way table here, we have our two variables. At the top, we have poor health and good health. So that is our level of health. So that is what that qualitative variable is. And then we also have not too happy, pretty happy, and very happy. That's going to be our level of happiness. So that's going to be our second qualitative variable. So right here, that's our level of happiness. Now, our first few questions are simply just going to ask us to make sure we can read this table. First, how many people were surveyed? And then how many very people, happy people were surveyed? And what proportion of people are in poor health? So if we can make these values. Well, to find how many people were surveyed, we simply just need to add up all these numbers together. So we do 43 plus 30, 61, 189, 22, and 122. Add up all these values together, and we get an overall total of 467. So that's how many people were surveyed. Nice and easy. Secondly, how many very happy people were surveyed? Well, very happy is this row right here, so 22 plus 122. That gives us a total of 144 uh, very happy people. And lastly, what proportion of people are in poor health? Well, to make a proportion or a relative frequency, we need to take the overall total, 467, 7, not 9, 467, and we need to find how many of those people are in poor health. Well, poor health is this row here, this column rather. So 43 plus 61 plus 22. So 43 plus 61 plus 22 gives us an overall total of 126. If I do 126 divide by 467, oh, it wasn't typing here, sorry. 126 divide by 467. I should get a proportion of about 27% or 0.27 or 27%. All 
All right, so just some pretty quick and easy questions. You hopefully should find that 4.4 is the easier section of all the parts in chapter four. I typically have students feel that way. All right, next we're gonna create a marginal frequency or frequency marginal distribution or marginal frequency distribution. Um, that sounds more complicated than it, is, than it is. Again, it's just a frequency distribution or frequencies that we put in the margins. So all we're going to do is make totals. Frequency is just the overall count. For example, not too happy uh, people, there's 43 plus 30, that's 73. That's it. And then we're going to continue down this pattern and just keep adding. 61 plus 189, that will give you 250. 22 plus 122 should give you 144. We already added these up earlier and got a total of 467. And we also already added all of poor health uh, earlier, and we found that there were 126 of those. If you add up all the values in good health, you should get uh, 3, what, 44? No, 341, sorry. 341. That's it. That's a frequency distribution, or a frequency marginal distribution couple of checks that you can always make. Make sure these three values add up to 467. Make sure these two values add up to 467. So you should be able to pretty easily check your work. Now in order to make them relative, what we're taking them relative to is the overall total. So that means for the not too happy people, there were 73 of them, but that's not really a helpful statistic unless we compare that to the total of 467. So 73 divided by 467, no, 73 divided by 467 should give us 0.16, I'll say. And that's it. That's what we're going to do for all of these. So if I continue down this pattern, for pretty happy, we have 250 people divided by 467. Gives us 0.54. And then for pretty, for very happy, we have 144 divided by 467, which is about 0.31. Now, again, check for these. If you add all these up, they should add up to approximately one. I will say approximately one because depending on how you round it or how many decimal places you use, it could actually end up being just a little bit slightly above or below. And in fact, if you do add up 0 0.16, 0 0.54, and 0 0.31, you'll actually get 1.01. .01. So a little bit too high, but that's simply because of rounding. But that doesn't mean that we round it incorrectly. We did round correctly for each of the values that we had. It just ended up being the case that you get some round off error. That happens sometimes. As long as it's approximately one, it should be fine. If we finish up the rest of these for the columns, if we do 126 divided by 467, and we also do 341 divided by 467, we should get our last uh, marginal frequencies. We get uh, 0 0.27, looks like, 0 0.27, and then 0 0.73. If you add these two together, that does add up to one. All right, so those are frequencies and marginal frequencies, or marginal relative frequencies. So not really too much introduced and should be relatively easy to work with. However, what we're about to get into is what I said was the real meat of this, which is conditional distributions. So what conditional distributions are going to do, they're going to create proportions just like the relative frequencies did. So where we take some overall value and divide by the total. The difference here is that when we're talking about conditional parts, we're not going to be considering everybody anymore. We're only going to be considering people that follow a specific condition. So depending on what that condition is, that will dictate how many people you're actually considering. We will not be considering all 467 anymore. We will only be considering people that follow a specific condition. Now that might sound, sound a little confusing, but let's look into this. Um, so here we're gonna construct a conditional distribution. And this, these conditional distributions we're making are conditional distributions of happiness given people are in poor health. So what that means is if I look at my original table, I'm first going to consider just the people in poor health. 
only these people. So my first question is going to be, what is the conditional distribution of people that are not too happy given they are in poor health? That means I'm not considering all 467 people anymore because I'm only considering those in poor health. 341 of those total are not in poor health, so I should not be considering them. Of the people in poor health, which there are 126 of them, we had that 43 of them are not too happy, right? 43, yeah. So 43 of those 126 are not too happy. Likewise, 61 and 22 of those 126 are also uh, are, are pretty happy and very happy, respectively, given that they're in poor health. So the main focus to understand how the fraction is going to be created is looking for that given condition. That's the whole point of conditional distribution. What is the assumed condition or assumed variable you're dealing with? Since it says I'm given I'm in poor health, I'm only considering those individuals. So only the p ones in poor health. When you do all of these, you will get different frequencies that we did before. So, or different relative frequencies. So 43 divided by 126, 61 divided by 126, which should be almost half, and 22 out of 126. So we get our uh, values there. Erase that. So we get 0.34, we get 0.48, and we get 0.17. Add these up, they should be approximately 1. I think that these add up to actually 0.99, but that's, again, just because of round off error. We can do the same thing with conditional distribution of happiness given good health. Since in this case, we are now given that they are in good health, we are only considering those that are in good health. So if I look up, I had 341 people in good health. So I should be making fractions out of those 341. So I have 30, 189, and 122. So 30, 189, and 122. All of those out of 341. So let's find those divisions. 30 divided by 341, 189, whoop, 89 divided by 341, and 122 divided by 341. Oh, I had a typo up there. Uh, so let's do 30 divided by 341 again, and then 189 divided by 341. Okay. So we got our values. 30 out of 341 ended up being about 0.09. 189 ended up being about 0.55. And last one being about 0.36. Those added up will actually equal 1, but I'll still say approximately 1. Just know it is possible to get 0.99 or 1.01. .01. If you get something like 1.05, that typically means that you maybe divided somewhere wrong, so you should check that. So those are conditional distributions. We also have those values then graphed down here in a side-by-side -side bar graph. Note these are bar graphs, not histograms, because they're qualitative variables. And for each variable, for each type of good health, we have a different bar showing what percentage of them are in different cases. So of those in poor health, how many are not too happy? Of those in poor health, how many are pretty happy? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So you can always still make side-by-side -side bar graphs with these. Okay. Now, for these last few questions, we're just going to analyze our given information. For example, is happiness associated with health and how? Uh, this is there's not as defined a way as we had before with calculating a correlation coefficient, comparing that to a critical value. This is more of a judgment call looking at the data and particularly the graph. The graph can really help you with this. Uh, what I'm starting to notice if I look at my bar graph here, 
Um, for poor health and good health, if I look at those that are not too happy, so those that are in the white box, I see that there's a significantly larger amounts of people that are not too happy while being in poor health than those that are not too happy while being in good health. Furthermore, those that are pretty and very happy, I see more of those or uh, more of those people that are in good health than I see of those people in poor health, specifically even with very happy. So I'll say that yes, there does seem to be an association. Again, not a, a causation, but yes, there does seem to be an association because of what I was just saying. Those that are not too happy are, um, I'll say those that are in poor health seem to be more likely to be not too happy compared to being very happy when it is the opposite for those in good health. So I see that if you're in poor health, you're more likely to be not too happy than you are to be not too happy if you're in good health. So I see like those comparisons there. Again, it's not as defined as a way, it's more just looking at the data and trying to make some conclusion. The next few, we could just answer some questions though. What proportion of people are pretty happy given that they are in poor health? Well, we just did that. Given that they are poor happy, uh, they're in, uh, sorry, given that they are in poor health, the people that are pretty happy are 0.48. So that's 0.48. What proportion of people, spelled wrong, what proportion of people are not too happy given that they are in poor health? So not too happy given they're in poor health, that's 0.34. And what proportion of people are very happy given that they are in poor health? So that was our last proportion, 0.17. This is showing that not all questions will ask you to create a table like this. You'll sometimes just see a question with a sentence. And what you're going to be looking for is the overall condition we're working with. So you're looking for that last part of each sentence that says, given that they are in poor health, given that they are in poor health, given that they are in poor health. That is going to dictate who you're talking about. We're not considering all 467 people anymore. We're only considering the 126 individuals that are in poor health. Okay, so conditional distributions take a little bit more work. We have one more example to go through this, and this example unfortunately has really large numbers, so I've already uh, calculated some of these to help you with this. The data below represents the employment status and level of education of all U.S. residents 25 years old or older in November 2014. We want to investigate whether the two variables are associated, so level of education and employment status. For example, are individuals who have a higher level of education more likely to be employed? So we're trying to see those, but again, these are qualitative variables, so hard to do with scatter plots. We have the two-way table given to us, and then it asks us to create frequency marginal distributions and relative frequency marginal distributions. Now, as I said, these are just using really large numbers, and calculating the frequency and marginal frequencies are not too bad. So what I've done is I've already calculated these for you. If you would like to pause the video now, and write these down, I recommend doing that or calculating them yourselves and checking to see what you get. Um, if I read through them, the totals at the bottom for frequencies, so starting with uh, this row here, I have 24,395, 61,442, 54,319, 68,564, with a total of 208,720. The total is going down. I have 128,744, uh, 128, 6,395, and 73,581. The relative frequencies, starting at the bottom and doing the row, I have 0 0.12, 0 0.29, 0 0.26, 0 0.33, and 1 as the overall total. 
going down the relative frequencies, I have 0 0.62, 0 0.03, and 0.35. Thankfully, in this case, all the relative frequencies do actually, in fact, add up to 1 exactly, so there are no round-off error issues here. Okay, so that's just making sure we can get the marginal values. You can calculate those on your own. That just kind of takes a while, so... I uh, don't feel like it's necessary to show all the typing for those. We do have a couple questions though. What proportion of those surveyed had a bachelor's degree or higher? Well, that's just the frequency distribution. Notice that it's not given any value. So of those surveyed is everybody had a bachelor's degree or higher. So that is this column here. So that is an answer of 0.33. What proportion of those were not in the labor force? Okay, not in the labor force is this row. And again, it's not given anybody, it's just everybody. 0.35. And what proportion of those surveyed were unemployed? So again, we're not given any condition here, we're just looking at all those that are unemployed. So that's the second row here, so we have 0 0.03. Alright. Now the next table is where we have our conditional distributions. Now, the conditional distributions we're making here, it says construct the conditional distribution of employment status given by the level of education. That's the important part, given by the level of education. Because it says given by level of education, that's what we're going to be working with first. We're going to say of those of this level of education, how many ha were employed, how many were unemployed, how many were not in the labor force. So that means for this first one here, for employment status, we're going to work with did not finish high school. And we had 24,395 of those. That I just grabbed from the first table we had. Then we're going to find how many of those were employed, unemployed, and not in the labor force. Now, in my mind, this gets a little bit tedious typing that in every time. And so I'm going to use list manipulation to do this. If you want to do this on your own and calculate a different way, that's fine. But if you want to learn how to do list manipulation and you're not sure, you could follow this real quick. I'm going to do the first columns, and then I'll pause and fill, fill out the rest. Um, so we're going to do first um, the employment status, given they did not finish high school. So we have, of those that did not finish high school, we have 10,179, 945, and 13,271. So I'm going to put those into a list, just those three values. And then what I'm going to do is I want to take all those values and I want to make them into, into proportions out of the total people that did not finish high school. So in order to do that, I'm going to go over to list two and I'm going to highlight the top of it. So it says L2 equals. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say take all the values from list one by saying second one. Uh, well, hold on, I just noticed there's a typo, I should say... 9.45, not 6.45. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to take all the values from list 1. So I should say L2 equals and hit second 1. So I have L2 equals L1. And I want to tell it to take L1 and divide it by the total, which is 24,395. That way it'll do all the divisions at the same time and will spit out the frequencies that I need. So I have my three answers now. For uh, did not finish high school, I have, whoop, there we go. I have 0.42, which is going to keep two decimal places to keep it simple, uh, 0 0.04, and 0.54. This, if you add these up, does in fact equal one. So there you go. I'm going to do that one more time with high school graduates, and I'm going to fill out the rest and pause it. So, high school graduates, we have 3,624, uh, 3, 2,612, and 25,806. I'm just going to replace list one because I don't really need it anymore. Um, and once I have these written down, I don't need the numbers anywhere in my list. So, I'm just replacing as I go. Then I'm going to go back up to list two, and I'm just going to say, hey, take L1 now, 
and divide by the total, which was 61,442. Hit enter, and we should get our divisions. So we get 0 0.55, 0 0.03, and 0.42. These also add up to 1. All right, I'm going to continue making these conditional distributions. And again, remembering that we're always considering the total amount of people in the level of education. Um, so I'm going to pause and fill out the rest of these. If uh, So you can go ahead and make them yourself real quick, and you can check your answers to see if you get the same ones I do. I'm going to pause in three, two, one. All right, so I have the rest filled out here. Uh, for some college, it's 0 0.65, 0 0.03, 0 0.31, which unfortunately adds up to just 0 0.99, but again, that's round off error. Uh, bachelor's degree is 0 0.72, 0 0.02, 0 0.25, which also adds up to 0 0.99. Round off error can happen. Okay, now we can answer some questions. First, what proportion of those surveyed were unemployed? Notice that this is just asking, of all those surveyed, how many were unemployed? Which I believe that we answered before, actually. Yep, we had that answer of what proportion of those surveyed were unemployed was 0 0.03. So that we just got from the original answer of the total amount of unemployed and then divided by the total uh, number of people surveyed. This is not given any condition, but the next two are. Next one says, what proportion of those surveyed were unemployed given they have a bachelor's degree? So given they have a bachelor's degree, how many of them were unemployed? So that means we are considering this column here where we got 0 0.02. And lastly, how many of those were unemployed given they had a high school degree? So that means that we are considering uh, they had a high school degree so that means we're considering this column here, and we get that value of 0 0.03. With all the values that we have, we should be able to create a triple bar graph for each of these. Um, so what we're going to do is make pro uh, proportion graphs for each of them. So did not finish high school, we have 0 0.42, 0 0.04, and 0 0.54. So I'll have up to 0.42-ish, so around there, 0 0.04, and then 0.54. Again, I'm obviously not the best artist, but I'm trying. I'll make a legend in just a moment, but I'm going to try to keep it in the same order. Uh, for a high school graduate, we have 0 0.55, 0 0.03, and 0 0.42. Point zero three and point four two. For some college, we have point six five, point zero three, point three one. And lastly, for bachelor's degree or higher, point seven two, point zero two, and point two five. Something like that. I then want to make a quick legend of the unemployment status. So employed, unemployed, and not in labor force. So I'll say employed, I'm going to shade black like this. For unemployed, I'm going to leave blank. And then for not in labor force, I'll use blue. Something like that. You always want a legend so you can show the, pers the person which one is which. If you also want to, want to use different shading styles, like dashed lines we used a couple pages earlier, you can do that. I'll just do these real quick. So the first column in each of these should be shaded black. That's indicating those that are employed. 
The second bar for each of these is in, is showing the not employed individuals, which we're going to leave blank. Then the last graph we're going to be shading blue, or the last bar in each graph we're going to be shading blue. There we go, something like that. All right. Last question here, just overall looking at it. What can we say about employment status and level of education? Well, from what I'm seeing, I'm seeing a general trend following some of these variables. Specifically for employment status, I'm seeing that as the level of education rises, so as you go, as you increase the level of education, then also the uh, relative frequency of those employed is increasing. And I see an inverse relationship with the uh, not in labor force and unemployed individuals. I see these bars starting to decrease. And same thing as well, even though very, very slightly, for unemployed. Unemployed was 0 0.04, 0 0.03, 0 0.03, and then 0 0.02. So when I see these general patterns, what I can say is something like, as the level of education increases, we see an increase in employed individuals and a decrease in those not employed and those not in the labor force. So I'm just seeing a general pattern like that. All right, that's everything for 4.4. Again, that last question may make it seem harder than it is. It's just because they use really large values. Overall, you're just trying to focus on what is the given value. That's going to determine how you set up your fraction for your relative frequency. That will also continue on when we get into chapter uh, five as well. So keep uh, conditional distributions in mind. But with that said, that's everything for section 4.4. At this point, you should be able to go through and complete all the homework for section 4.4 and all of chapter 4 itself. Uh, so go ahead and do that before you dive into chapter 5. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to put those in the comments below or ask your instructor directly. I hope you have a nice day.